Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the second installment in a three-part series that we're doing where we're taking a deep dive into some of the classic album designs of Blue Note Records. And we're seeing just how far we can take some of the principles and ideas that we're learning and how we can apply that back into our web design world. Now, if you haven't done so already, definitely make sure to check out the first video in this series because that's really where we run through all of the foundational pieces of how we're setting everything up. We talk about this whole element tree and what every piece is kind of doing to get us to this point here. As for this video, we're really just gonna dive right in since all of that is already explained in that first part. So do check that out if you got a moment. Now I picked Blue Train here because I think it's a fun exercise in getting inside the mind of a photographer and an art director working together to ultimately create the final piece that would end up becoming this album cover. As we mentioned in the previous video, you would often have at these recording sessions, Francis Wolf, one of the founders of Blue Note, taking photos of the musicians during that recording session, just doing their thing. And at the end of that session, you'd ultimately end up with a contact sheet of tons of different photos that could ultimately be part of the final composition. What I think is really fun to explore is taking a look at what was originally captured by Francis, but then ultimately cropped down through the design process to become the end product that we see here. And so in the spirit of that, I actually ended up using that full original photo that you just saw here to get it positioned just right. I didn't do any cropping or anything in Photoshop to get it positioned as you see it. Now how this is working is I'll click on my image element here and you'll see that we've just got our cell inside of our grid and we're spanning it across the entire X axis and the Y axis of our grid. This is pretty much just like the Art Blakey example that we discussed in our previous video. And it's a really great trick to be aware of when you do need something to just be spread out across the entirety of your grid that you're working with. Next, we've turned on our advanced background layer here. And you can see from the image preview here that we've got that full image that I was referencing earlier. But what I've done here is play around with my background size and background position values to get this set up just so. Now, since we're using our responsive uniform font sizing technique with that clamp function that we talked about in the previous video, we have a really strong foundation to work with proportional values that will respond in a very predictable and manageable fashion. So when you typically see this size input, by default, it's set to cover, which you might know from the CSS spec will effectively take the image and make sure that it's spread out across the entire boundary that it's constrained to. So for example, since this image is a little bit taller than it is wider, you'll see that the width is being spread out all the way. So it's to the far edges of that cell that we're working in. And then basically the top and bottom of the image are just being cut off a little bit. And it's a great technique to be aware of. And for most hero image situations on the web, it's really the perfect solution. However, for this setup, you'll remember that the ultimate goal here is to have something that would respond down and maintain all of the proportions of the content inside of this faux record label that we're working on here. And since we have that baseline responsive font sizing set up, we can use our M values to get things working just the way we need. So when I go back to my size input and place in this 46M auto value, what this is effectively saying is that the background image should be 46Ms wide. So just all the way up the document tree, it's being sized relatively to the font size of its parent containers. Next, we've got our position input here, which again, by default, you would typically see as center. Now the center keyword can also be written out as 50%. And what we've got in both of those cases when we're using just that one value is we're saying, Across the X and Y axis, we want this to be oriented at the very center of the picture. Now, if you're not familiar with the background position property, we could also break this out into two values to say 50% again. And now we are even more specifically saying that the X and Y axis should both be at that value. And this technique is important because it's what we're using right here with our original value. So you can see as I update this value here, that I'm moving my image across that X axis to get it oriented just where I want. So for example, if I set this to zero, we can see that our background graphic is at the far left edge of our original image asset. 
Conversely, if I put this at 100, you can see that it's been pushed to the far right edge of that asset. So somewhere in the middle there is gonna be that sweet spot that gets us right where we wanna be. Likewise, our second value here allows us to set the y-axis positioning. So if I go to zero, you'll see the very top of the image is aligned to the top of our element there, and 100 would of course push it all the way down to the bottom. So ultimately, just like our x-axis, we wanna find that kind of happy value that gets us back to our reference image, and that'll give us a really strong foundation to work with when positioning the rest of our elements on our album artwork. Now, you'll notice from looking at the image preview over here that we've got a grayscale image. There's no color being applied to it from the image itself. So how we're getting that look is if I jump up to my artwork layer here, which is again our grid element that we're working on, I've applied a simple background color here, which can then be blended with our image by clicking back on the cell, going to its effects module, and then playing around with this mix blend mode control. You'll notice that currently it's set to multiply, which effectively means it will take each pixel on that layer and then multiply its color value by the color behind it. And you end up getting this composite of the two values playing off one another. So I could completely bypass this by jumping up to normal, which just gives us the grayscale image back and then set it back to multiply. And I think it's fun to just kind of go through the list here sometimes and get a sense of what these different values can do and the results that you could achieve as you play around with your source material and also the colors behind it. Now, the one final bit of adjustment I did here was a little bit of contrast, brightness, blur, kind of like what we did on the previous Art Blakey example. So real quickly, if I just remove this value from the input, you'll see that we get a much more contrasty image than we have from our original reference image here. So if I jump back over and then place those back, we've got the softening effect happening from the blur here. We're brightening things up just a little bit after we reduce the contrast. And ultimately I felt like that was kind of getting me in the ballpark of the original reference image here. All right, so next let's chat about the grid structure I'm using. I've got the lines turned on over in the live preview just so we can visualize this a little bit better. And you can see from the columns template that there's nothing too crazy going on here. We've got our 1M values on either side of the album cover, and that is being used to push our text away from the edges just a tiny little bit. And then our 1FR value in the middle here is just spanning all of the remaining space on the cover. Next, we've got five rows that we're using to space everything on the cover here. Again, we've got this top value that's being used to push our text away from the top of the album cover just a little bit. And then you'll see we've got these two auto values right here. And this is an important trick to be aware of when working with CSS Grid. If you're ever placing content where you need the cell to grow intrinsically based on the size of the content within, you'll wanna use this auto value. That will ensure that for situations like this where we've got larger text on this first line and smaller text on my next line, I don't need to go in and set any hard values to get that positioned just the way I want. Additionally, if this was a more traditional responsive design or maybe we had some long form text that was wrapping into multiple lines, as that text continues to wrap, those new lines created by the wrapping are going to make the overall text block grow in height. And if we were to set some type of hard value here, whether using pixels or M's or whatever, at some point that text block would break out of that explicitly sized cell. So just a really important trick here. Anytime you're working with text or images or just content in general, make sure to play around with these auto values. They are a huge help when working with CSS Grid. Next, we've got our tiny M gap right here, which is being used to space our two lines of text away from one another. And then we're just using a final value of one FR to again, fill all of the remaining space on our album cover where we're not placing anything, we just need to define a coordinate for our grid to take up. So once we have all of that defined, you can see that we're using a pretty straightforward approach like our last design. We've got our image layer here, which is being spread out across the X and Y axis. And that's ensuring that it will always take up the full size of our canvas that we're working on. So now we can talk about these lines here. Nothing too crazy going on. We've got our first line here, which is positioned at the second and third lines for our grid, which you can see right over here. 
and also at the second and third lines of our y-axis, which you can see right here. If we scroll down just a little bit, you'll see that we've got our Flexbox positioning enabled and we're using a row layout and then aligning all of the content within that cell to the end of the horizontal axis of that cell. So that's how we're getting our John Coltrane line pushed over to the right here. And then the next line is not too dissimilar. You'll see that we've got our coordinates set up here to position it on our grid. The main difference here in our Flexbox layout is we're using space between across the horizontal axis. And that's how we're ensuring that the two text elements inside this line are being spread out to the far edges of that container. Again, like many design situations, there's probably a couple dozen ways we could break this up and set up the grid and our positioning and Flexbox layouts. But to me, this felt like the most straightforward approach with how I was trying to work with everything here. All right, so let's turn the grid off here and we'll talk about these text elements now. Kind of like our previous example, when matching fonts, I spent some time, of course, looking at the reference image, getting a sense of how the serifs and the arcs and the stems all kind of looked and function on these characters. And again, I couldn't find something exactly like this font, which I believe is Clarendon, but it's not too hard to just take a quick screenshot of this and then go to Google Fonts and compare kind of the most important pieces of the font and try and find something that really approximates the overall look and feel. Now, one thing I had to be careful with was these numbers here because different fonts will treat these figures differently with how they want to approach the overall design. These, of course, are matching the kind of overall sizing and spacing of the letters here, but some fonts will have numbers that maybe are designed more like a small caps type setup or just have a different kind of look to them. So that actually helped me kind of hone in on what I needed to use a little bit more easily. Now you can see from our example here that our font is not a perfect match. The numbers don't quite match the figure of these right here. But overall, it has the general characteristic and look and feel that I'm going for. I believe this font was called Domini, if that's how you pronounce it. And interestingly, even it didn't quite get me all the way there with all of the matches that it had. So I ended up actually, once again, exploring our number one rule that you're never supposed to break, which is scaling the text in a horizontal fashion to get it a little bit more wider so that it would match the figures of the original font. So you'll see real quickly, if I scroll down here, we've just got a general setup with our font size and our color. And then if I jump over to my effects module, we've got a few of the tricks that we've already talked about from our first video that you can see here again. Now this time I put the slight blur that we talked about from the Blakey example actually on the text itself. And I did that in this example to experiment with using different values for different parts of the image. So some words might be a little bit more or less blurred. And of course, it gives me more independent control over the image itself or the kind of wear and tear layer that we have. Again, it's just a slightly different approach that we're exploring here. But you can see from my transform layer here that we've got a bit going on. I've just skewed it a tiny little bit to give it a sense of kind of warping going on. And then we've also scaled it across our X axis here. So if I remove all of these transforms, you'll see that our matching font definitely doesn't get us into the ballpark of where we need to go. But with that slight little stretch, we actually end up getting it much closer. Now, something to keep in mind when you're working with these transforms that I don't think I actually covered in the previous video is your transform origin. By default, when working with these transforms, they will originate from the center of the asset. So what that effectively means if I click on this here is you'll see that it's spreading out from the central point of the text and moving outward both to the left and right since we're scaling it on that X axis. And what we end up with that is a little bit of an overhang here that obviously we don't want since this text needs to be right aligned. So the simple fix here is to jump over to our transform origin control and then originate that transform from the right edge so that it is only growing out to the left. And really, I did a very similar approach with these other fonts here. It was simply a matter of looking at the reference material and then finding a balance of the letter spacing on the words themselves and then going down to my effects layer here and playing with the transforms to get it just how I wanted. So if I take this out, you can see the difference from that to the original. And then if we put it back here, 
We can now compare that with the original. And finally, we've got our blue note line here, which we can see we're doing, again, a very tiny amount of setup here. And then on the effects module, we've got our blur filter going on as well as this transform, which again, when we compare to the original, you can see the difference that this transform really makes on everything. And I think that just about does it for Blue Train. Up next for the final part of our series, we're gonna discuss the genius of modern music himself, Thelonious Monk. 